Good morning. This morning, we're so excited to have Caitlin Hendricks on, Vice President of Business Development at Byline Bank. And Caitlin has actually been involved intimately in the flex workspace industry over the last few years. So I'll let her kind of chime in on that. But as a co-host, we have Richie Parsons, who actually used Byline for one of his uh, two locations that he currently has. And so he, it'll be, it's an interesting evolution of how he went through the SBA process on this location. So Caitlin, thanks for joining us and so excited to have you on. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So why don't you tell us a little bit, how long have you been at Byline? How'd you get into it? Have you always done SBA stuff? Kind of what's, what's been that evolution? Yeah. Been at Byline for 10 years now. I started as an intern, worked my way up through the credit department, and then eventually hit a point where it was make a decision, am I going to stay in credit or do I want to try something else and get in the sales role? So I took the opportunity. I joined our inside sales team and we've you know, just been working on growing different verticals, getting in different spaces, lending to all different types of industries. And this space was something that you know was newer, popped on our radar, and we thought, hmm, this kind of sounds like something interesting. Maybe this would be something we would like to get into. So, you know, we've just been trying to get the name out there, get the word out there that we're lending to the space and, you know, make as many contacts as we can. So we've started with VentureX and Office Evolution. We've done some deals in that space and you know, just want to keep growing and, you know, meeting more people in the industry. Yeah, for sure. Richie, you want to talk about kind of what, I mean, let, some people haven't heard your podcast or may not know who you are. But ultimately, you want to give your quick background and kind of your your background into SBAs and kind of how you started using them, whether it was with your previous business endeavors or if it just started here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so Richie Parsons, my wife, Chris, and I own a few VentureX locations. We're VentureX franchisees. We are located in Northern Virginia outside of Washington, D.C., and expanding into Nash the Nashville market, actually, in the fall, we'll be opening in downtown Nashville. So we're growing, trying to grow quickly, which means we need access to capital. That's one of the most frequent and most important problems I'm trying to solve. In our previous career, we were any type fitness franchisees and ha have been for about a decade. We had six locations in three states. We have one left. And so coming into co-working and VentureX, I had financed several gyms. I had a lot of experience working with banks, had some longstanding relationships with banks, but due to sort of the lower capital need, I'll say, for a gym like Anytime Fitness, I never even considered doing an SBA loan. It, it just never came up. I did just traditional financing. A lot of it was based on relationship and didn't really have any issues. And we get into VentureX, and that was the first time we were kind of forced to start looking at SBA options because it was quite a bit more money, one, and two, the co-working industry, the same bankers that I've been working with to open gyms when I was like, hey, I'm, I'm now, now I'm doing co-working. I've got VentureX right here. They kind of looked at me a little more skeptically and were not as gung-ho about giving me capital as they had been when I was doing gyms. And so that is, that was my introduction into SBA first VentureX. Yeah. So let's even back up, Caitlin. What is an SBA, right? There's some people that may not even know what an SBA is. You want to kind of give us a, a foundation of, of what, what exactly that is and how it came to be? Yeah. So an SBA loan is a government guaranteed loan. There are different, you know, different banks can offer SBA loan products. There's a couple different types of products out there. Generally, with these type of projects, we're looking at the SBA 7A loan program. So it's a, <clears throat> it's a fully amortizing loan, which essentially means that, you know, you're Principal and interest are going to be over that the term of that loan, and generally they're 10 years. So by the time you hit your 10, you're making your last payment. There's no balloons, nothing like that. The, the beauty of these loans is that they are not required to be fully secured. A lot of times when you're going after conventional financing, conventional lenders want collateral behind it. The beauty of the SBA loan is it's not required. If it's there, you know, we have to take it as collateral, but otherwise it's okay if it's not a fully secured loan. And these loans are mostly based on the cash flow of the business. So we're looking at, you know, your projections a lot. In a lot of cases, these are startup locations, right? So we're looking at your projections, making sure they show sufficient cash flow to be able to service the debt um, that you're looking to take on. 
Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that's such a, a great way to, to kind of set the foundation that people even understand what it is, because I mean, I think it's super interesting and we've just run into this and you started working with it is there's actually bankers that don't really even understand what an SBA will do and won't do. Like we just had um, a person within our industry go through a three month process of waiting for approvals. We were sitting on a lease only to be told by quote unquote, a friend of his that the SBA does not do co-working. And so it's just interesting uh, because Office Evolution and VentureX and others are actively closing deals as we go. And I was like, let's let's revisit this with somebody else, which is ultimately how you and I were able to connect to to Richie. Um, <laughs> Richie, you want to talk about your specific situation where essentially that Fairfax location you built on cash and then decided, hey, I'm going to leverage this. And what was that process like with with Byline and, and Caitlin and kind of We'll jump into kind of some of the things that are important for people to to have uh, their ducks in a row, really, if they're, they're going to go after this process. Yeah, Fairfax, we definitely got the cart before the horse a little bit on that one. We, as we were planning to build that one out and purchase all of our, you know, FF&E and all that, the numbers looked manageable to the extent that I, I didn't think we would need to get a loan. And so I didn't really shop for loans. I, I had I had kind of early on reached out to, again, the bank we were banking with and had a relationship with, and they had been a little bit, you know, cold, cool toward, uh, toward giving us financing for a second location. Our first location was less than two years old. We didn't have this long history of tax returns and, and they really wanted to see us prove ourselves more. So I was like, you know what? I, you know, we have cash. We had, we had raised some money through investors and just decided to to march forward with the cash we had. Well, then we ran into some significant delays in our construction due to a permitting system problem that the county had. It wasn't our problem; it, it was theirs, but it, it it delayed us in our construction start, and so that kind of crunched our cash flow. But then also, uh, our construction ended up. The time between building out our first Venturex and our second Venturex, they were only about 18 months apart, but construction costs went up like 20, 25% more. And they were already inflated when we built our first one. So we kind of took for granted that we'd already seen the peak and, and we hadn't. And so so then construction costs are up. So now we're, we're building out this location. We're already into it. We're rolling. Now we have to open. We're just spending money, all the money we have. And so that's when I reached out. In fact, came on, was it Venturex that connected us? I can't even remember how we got connected. Yeah, I think it was. Okay. So then I had reached out to Caitlin or VentureX had Caitlin reached out to me and she made me aware that, that you could get an SBA loan as a reimbursement loan. So, hey, I've already spent this money. Here's all the money I spent, bank. Can you give me that money back and just collateralize everything I bought with the money I spent? And I, I had no idea that was even an option. Um, and that was a lifesaver for us because we needed operating capital. We needed all the stuff that we didn't have because we had put it all into the location. And then Byline Bank came in with an SBA loan to reimburse us for all the expenses that they could qualify, which was quite a bit. Again, I don't know if we, we haven't really mentioned this yet, but when you're working with the SBA, everything is very specific. The government is very particular about how everything is listed. If you do you know, we have several different LLCs. We have a kind of a parent company that oversees our locations. And so sometimes the parent company will buy something for a subsidiary or whatever. Well, the government doesn't like that because it wants the name of the LLC on the credit card to match the name of the LLC that they're giving the money to. And so they're they're trying to connect all these dots. And so it was a lot of almost like, you know, somebody, you know, ripped up a treasure map and you're trying to piece it back together. And maybe they burned a couple of pieces and you're like trying to trying to figure out how the whole thing goes together. So the government will look at it and be like, oh, okay, yeah, we'll give you money for this. And so it was a long process, but ultimately, you know, we were able to finance the vast majority of what we had spent and recoup those funds. So then we could use them for operating capital and for future expansion. So it was a fantastic program that I was unaware of completely. Caitlin, so yeah, kind of playing off of that. I mean, if someone's interested in this, I mean, the first thing, obviously, they'd reach out and, and touch base with you. But what should they have prepared going into that initial conversation? You know, what things do they need to know? And then let's kind of jump into kind of what's this, the part two, right? What what all is, is the fact finding for, for you? And then ultimately, you have to or you choose to visit the locations. So let's kind of talk through that. 
Yeah. So if somebody is interested in an SBA loan, obviously, first step, go ahead, reach out, happy to take a phone call, email, you know, whatever it is. We would just discuss what the project is, right? Is this a startup? Are you looking to do a reimbursement like Richie did? Is this your first location, second location? You know, let's let's just kind of talk things through first. From there, again, usually these are startups, so projection basis, right? I'm looking for a business plan, projections. I'm looking for a breakdown of what your project costs are. And the same kind of goes for whether it's a startup or a reimbursement, right? You've got to have an idea of what our loan proceeds are going to go towards, tells us our loan amount, tells us an equity injection if we need one, you know, and then from there we start to structure what that loan is going to look like. So once we have that down, then we're at a point where, you know, if the person is ready, we can start collecting the documentation that's needed for underwriting. You know, if you've got existing locations, we're going to want to look at the financials from the prior locations that have opened already. Any other businesses you've got 20% more ownership in, we've got to analyze those financials as well. You know, so we just start to build the package from there, go through the underwriting process, you know, go towards our approval. And then, you know, from there we go through the closing process. So the nice thing about the SBA is, yes, there are rules. There are specific rules that you have to stick to that you have to abide by. But one of the things that we pride ourselves at as byline is let's try to come up with a creative solution, you know, to what your financing needs are. So like in Richie's case, we did the reimbursement. It's something that's totally allowable by the SBA. But, you know, let's look at the specifics. What do you need to be reimbursed? What do you not need to be reimbursed? How can we make this as easy as possible, you know, to get to that final goal of getting the funds that you need? Yeah, and I I kind of chimed in on so you you visit the location. What yeah. is when you visit, what are you trying to look at? The building, the market, the franchisee, or the the person you're you're financing? What is what does that look like? So mostly I'm wanting to get to know the franchisee. Um, that's what we really like to get out of that business. Sometimes I don't get to see the locations necessarily. A lot of times in a startup, you know, I'm walking into just a blank space and I don't know what these even look like because I'm not coming back out there once they're finished either. So in Richie's case, I really appreciated it. And I got to see a a finished location, um, you know, which is exciting, but I'm mostly talking to the franchisee. I want to know, you know, more about them, more about their background. What have they done in the past that, they can utilize to make this, you know, work on a go forward basis. You know, have they, I'm trying to get out of the conversation. Have they thought through this? You know, what's the marketing plan going to be? How do you get people in? What happens if things are going to ramp up slower than what you're projecting them to? You know, do you have backup plans in place? Do you have a franchisor behind you that can help you? You know, that sort of thing. Just making sure they've really put that thought into this. Because I mean, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money people take on to, to get something up and running. So. Yeah. Well, part of what we like to do at Flex Uncensored is put people on the spot, have really cool conversations. So what were the initial thoughts that you had about Richie and what made you comfortable financing him? Oh, with Richie, you know, after having our initial phone call, I knew that he had run other businesses before. That gives us a lot of comfort. We put a lot of emphasis on management experience, whether it's in the industry, not in the industry. He also had an existing venture location open at the time. So I know he'd already gone through it. You know, he'd gone through that ramp up. He'd made it, you know, so it's more of, okay, what did you learn from that location that you could apply to this location to make it ramp up faster or be a better business, you know, than the first one or something like that. So it's really nice. It was really nice talking to him because he had that experience behind him already. I was like, this is, this is going to be good. We check this box to the T. And having a really smart wife that makes you keeps you online makes a big difference too. It does. It does. It, it, in a joke around about he brings sometimes he'll bring his his kiddos on our tours, and I'm like, oh, it's the board of directors. So he is he is well represented, and and that's that's one of my favorite things about Richie is his his passion for people and his family and faith and everything else. So speaking of getting to know people better, so tell us about you. What what made what's why. Why are you passionate about doing what you do? What do you enjoy doing outside of work? Let's get people to know you a little bit so they know who they're doing business with or reaching out to. So I originally was a personal trainer. I went to school for exercise science. um, And then I decided that that wasn't the hours I wanted to have, especially if I wanted a family. Um, So I went back to school, got a master's in accounting and I took an internship. I found an internship through school and I was like, well, I'll try this. 
you know, we'll see how it goes. And I just, I really enjoyed it. I never thought having like a desk job, so to speak, was going to be a rewarding career. Because as a personal trainer, you know, you get to see people transform their bodies, right? And they, you know, they love the what's happening, how they feel, things like that. It's very rewarding. The same can be said for this industry too. I got to learn a lot about a lot of different types of industries, which is really cool. You know, and then I'm helping people reach their dreams. You know, they're getting the financing they need to either buy a business or open a business. You know, this is this is what a lot of people do. A lot of the times I'm I'm meeting people who are looking for a loan who come out of the corporate world and they're done with that. And they just they want to pursue this passion. So that's kind of what makes me, you know, do what I do, makes me love what I do. I do get to meet a lot of cool people like Richie. <laughs> so, you know, that's been fun. But yeah, outside of work, I'm I work out a lot still. I, I've got two kids. I'm married. So, you know, lots of family time, hanging around with our friends, that sort of thing. Where do you live? I am in the Chicago area. So we're in the suburbs. Yeah, Chicago is one of my favorite markets for three months out of the year. You yes, can keep the, it the other nine months. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it, so it, 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 Go ahead, Richie. I, I just think it's interesting that you were in the gym industry. I didn't know that. Uh, I yeah. We discussed that. And, I have this theory that every other industry in the world can be related back to the gym industry. I have, I have, I tell everybody that co-working is, is that running a flexible office space is the same as running a gym. There, there are so many overlapping characteristics that it was an easy transition for us. And to hear you talk about how banking is, is a lot like, you know, being in a gym with a personal <laughs> trainer, right? I think I think you probably take any industry and if you have gym industry experience, there's something or probably several things that translate to the other thing. I just, I yeah. not been grown yet. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it definitely is. I noticed the same thing too. You know, when I talk, when we talk about these co-working businesses, they're, they're basically run like, a, like a gym. You've mm -hmm. got your members, they have memberships, there's perks for, you know, different levels that you're paying for. And I'm like, this makes total sense. This is exactly like a gym. Or even like sure. trainers, right? The, the trainers have a business within the business, right? And so it's the same thing for, for our members and clients is they have, whether you're a lawyer, a CPA, you know, CPA, a financial advisor, a counselor, you have your own book of business within the business, right? And so it's very, it correlates in a lot of ways. Yep. Yep. Even, even my industry in banking and the sales role, it's, I work for a bank, but at the same time, like I've got my, my clientele that I'm working with, you know, my specific industries that I'm working with, you know, specific borrowers, things like that, you know, they're always coming back. I need help with this. I'm going to do a second project. So in a way it's, you know, like nurturing that business. Yeah. And I think one of the, the interesting parts about it is how the, the industry has evolved uh, within the flex workspace co-working industry, but also the office environment, right? I mean, uh, you were in in Chicago during COVID, so co COVID was a big deal in Chicago, bigger than a lot of other places. Um, but it's something we've all had to kind of go into and come out of, right? And there's been a shift on how the office is used. Kind of what is what has been your experience with the banking world and how they look at office, how they look at flex workspace? I mean, we continue to see. Uh, lenders shy away from office to a certain extent while we try to figure out what we're doing in this world. So kind of what's been your experience on the inside of the banking world? What have been the internal conversations? I think that within our bank, I think, I can't speak for other banks, but within our bank, I think they kind of see this as, you know, the future, right? Especially with doing multiple deals within this industry, I can add to that conversation every time another deal goes for approval, because I learned something new from every um, operator that I've talked to. So, you know, somebody brings up the fact that, yeah, we have a lot of like startup small businesses, you know, one, two person, and then they grow out of us and they move on to, you know, getting their own space. But I mean, a lot of people are doing the work from home thing. I really think that this is the, this is the future. This is where things are going. And you know, I think it's it's important to get on board, and I'm glad that we got on board. You know, with this concept and got comfortable with it when we did. Yeah, and we're getting you further and further on board, right? So, yep. Rich, Richie's uh, Richie's uh, part of the GWA board of directors, and he's really helping out as as I just kind of put the content together, and and we we've prepared for the conference that we've got coming up in September in Phoenix. 
uh, which I hope all the listeners are going to be at her. But Bridgie came up with, with the idea of having a panel that talks about financing and SBA and everything else. And your, your name came up. We're talking to a couple other people, but super excited to have you there. And I guess, I don't know what, what point this will air, but in the near future. And so, you know, Richie, you want to kind of chime in on some of the conversations you're having internally, because not only are you on the GW board of directors, you're actually on the franchisee board internally at uh, Vast and VentureX specifically. What conversations are being had around financing, SBAs, all these things within the franchise community that you, you're part of? I think everybody is trying to figure out how to get access to more money. I mean, that is one of the... That's one of two biggest problems that, that we're dealing with as a, as a as our own sort of group trying to grow. But I think other franchisees within VentureX and, and other co-working operators, I, I mean, through GWA, I think finding the right buildings uh, and the right deal is really important. But even then, once you find that deal and that building and that landlord is willing to play ball, finding a bank that's willing to cover those deal points is also a challenge. And I think, Kaylin, I'd be interested in part of Part of the conversation I, I hope we we get in Phoenix is is trying to educate co-working operators on the things they can do to set themselves up to have a better chance, a better likelihood of getting of getting financing, getting that capital, making themselves more attractive to a bank. You mm-hmm. talked about some of the, you know, there's some things that people can't change. They can't change their their background. They can't change, you know, how much business experience they already have. They can't change whether they've already done this before or not. So there are certain things you guys are going right. to look for that, you know, they're not going to have as, as kind of in the wind column for them. But I, I found through working with you guys and working with others, there are some things they can do, I think, uh, that, that they can control. Like, mm-hmm. one of them would be how they structure their real estate deal with the landlord. I, I found that the SBA, and, and I don't know what of these things are like hard and fast rules and one of, what of them are like preferences, but it seems like, the SBA has some preferences when it comes to how the deal is structured, whether the landlord's paying for build out or not, and and who is controlling the build out or not, whether the landlord's paying for it and owning it, or whether the landlord's paying for it but the franchise owns it. There's there's all kinds of variables in there, and I feel like there are ways that the SBA would like that interaction to look. Probably that if I'm somebody who going to have trouble getting financing. At the very least, I can say, all right, I'm going to set out to structure a deal that I can just hand to an SBA bank. And they're going to be like, oh, this looks exactly how I would like it to look. So we're over at least that hurdle. Are there some things that people can think about as a structuring deals that would help? Yeah, I think I think there are definitely some things you know that would help. And sometimes, like you said, there are factors that they can't change. But you know, when it when it comes to the construction piece, it can be tricky, especially when you've got, you know, landlords putting up a lot of money, you know, to take care of all or most of the cost of the build out. We kind of look at it two ways, right? One, what's preferable? And number two, what's going to be easiest for us to do? Because going through the construction process is not easy. There's a lot of paperwork that goes into it. There's a lot of time that goes into it. And nobody wants to, you know, take up all that time. Um Easiest thing, easiest way is if the landlord covers the whole project or like as far as leasehold improvements go, or, you know, if it's a combination of the borrower has enough funds to be able to cover the portion that the landlord isn't financing. We don't have to worry about any of that then. Um, We don't have to worry about those conditions. We can get to our closing a lot faster. You know, we can see that the franchisee or operator, they've got you know, sufficient cash flow to be, or sufficient funds to be able to put into the project, um, you know, maybe even outside of what we require for an equity injection. That actually adds a lot of strengths to the deal. They've got a lot of skin in the game. The That's all, not always an option though, right? Not everybody has that kind of cash to put up. You're not always going to find the, the landlord that's going to do that that type of a deal. You know, so when we do have landlord funds going into the project, the easiest way To handle that would be if the bank finances the whole thing and the landlord funds just come in after the fact to reimburse. Those would come in, they pay down your loan, your loan gets reamortized, and then, you know, you've got your true principal and interest monthly payment, you know, at that point. The only downside to that is you're paying interest on it up front. So you're putting out a little bit more because you're paying on that, you know, that full project cost when the landlord could have been covering that as opposed to yourself. 
you know, but that does allow the bank then to take control of the project, make sure they're getting all the required documentation that they need. You know, nothing's missing. There's no holdups along, you know, along that side of things. Otherwise, you know, if that's not an option, which again, it's not, it's not always something that can work out that way. And to be honest, I don't see that, that being one of the options in this industry the majority of the time, you know, so if you've got the bank and the landlord putting funds in together, it's just really appreciated if the landlord can work with the bank, you know, don't keep us in the dark, don't keep documentation to yourself, you know, make sure that it's readily available. You know, we all have the common goal. We want this business to get up and running. Let's work together to make that happen. You know, so if we've got a landlord that's on board with that, it makes it a lot, a lot easier. You know, nobody's missing out on anything. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's, that's important to understand is what is, how does the SBA, I mean, how's the government look at this, right? Who does it go to from your desk? Where does it go? I mean, give you a great example, right? This person that we, I mentioned earlier his buddy was doing the financing. They they asked for all kinds of information over a three month period, and then came back and said, "Oh, we don't fund co working, right?" And so, yeah. do you, you're a preferred lender? What's is yes. that right? Yes. So byline uh, byline bank is a preferred lender, which means that we are not required to submit every deal we do to the SBA for their approval. Banks that aren't preferred lenders will have to send their their loans to the SBA for their approval. That's called general processing. It adds a significant chunk of time, right? Especially if it's a really busy time, the SBA gets to it when they get to it. Um, you know, but when when you are submitting a deal and it goes through that general processing path, you have to be very particular about how you're describing this business. You know, if passive real estate income is not an eligible business under the SBA program. And if you're not describing co-working, you know, as it is like more like a gym, these are memberships, you know, let's focus around the different membership levels. What do you get for that? You know, what are the other benefits outside of it? Aside from, you know, just having a place to work, you know, is there coffee? Is there copying? Are there mailboxes? Can we use this address as our business address? You know, what are those other services that you're providing? The SBA can take that the wrong way. It's not usually like, hey, let's pick up the phone and talk about it. They send you a bunch of questions and you go back and forth. So it can take a lot of time. And if they're not understanding it or you're not explaining it right, you know, it, it can be taken the wrong way. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think that's a big part is having someone that understands the business, right? And is it can, it can answer some of these questions before they have to come back. And mm -hmm. it just gives a certain amount of credibility to everything. And I think it, that just makes a, a big difference in the process. Yes, definitely. So as, as far as let's, let's talk about what people's uh, qualifications are, right? I mean, we've had, you have everything from people that have limited funds and resources to people that have significant ones, right? And so let's, let's kind of focus on the minimums, right? Because we've had, you kind of mentioned this right now, we're closing the loan right now where the bank basically said, you know, none of our money can go towards the build out. It can go towards the operating of the business and the FF and E. Um, and so they're they're holding out until the construction's actually done before they're willing to close the loan. So kind of talk about kind of minimum qualifications and kind of what you look for from that standpoint. So it's kind of a trick question because we look at every deal differently, right? They're never the same. You never get two of the same deals. Every individual is different. Every business is different. Every location is different. So one of the things we don't do is stick everybody in the same credit box and see how it works. That's not not how we operate. You know, I'm I'm looking at the project as a whole, right? If you're a brand new person in this industry and you're looking to take on a space that, you know, seems to be more square footage than, you know, what we normally see, it's going to be more expensive. Is this is this going to be worth it? Are your projections going to show enough cash flow? How are you going to do that ramp up? That might be something where, you know, we'll be like, mm, maybe we should scale this back a little bit. You know, this looks like it's too expensive. When I'm looking at something, I'm looking at what's on their personal financial statement versus the project cost. And if I'm going through that project and I'm seeing that the equity injection is going to be pretty significant and, and it doesn't look like their personal financial statement can cover that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I don't, I don't think this is going to work. We need to find outside investors to make this work. Or we need to look at a smaller project. Maybe this is too much to take on, you know, being your first location. 
you know, so it's not just like I'm looking at something and saying, no, it's let's figure out how to make this work. Let's make this fit into, you know, what you can do. So can't really say there's a minimum. You know, we want to see that there's post-close liquidity after, you know, an equity jet injection comes in. One of the nice things with franchises in this industry is we put a lot of weight on that. You know, when it comes to industry experience or having owned a business before, if you haven't done that and you're a franchisee, that helps boost your management experience. You know, which again, we place a lot of weight on that. So we like that aspect of it. You know, if you have owned a business before, you know, what skills do you have from that business, you know, that can go towards this? You know, we, we play off of that. If you're an independent, for example, and you're looking to get into this and you don't have the experience, are there people that you can bring on as minority partners? Are there people that you can like bring on as a board behind you? You know, can we get that set up? How can we boost this? So coming from a credit background, especially within Byline, I'm paying a lot of attention to what the holes in a deal might be as I'm starting to go through it. And, you know, let's figure out how to mitigate those holes, those weaknesses, you know, before we get to underwriting, because it makes for a much more pleasant experience when we get to the underwriting piece and the thing starts moving forward. Rich, you got anything? Yeah. So on that, I, I had one accountant who I worked with for almost a decade, basically the whole time we were fully in the gym industry. And then as we, we had moved from West Virginia to Virginia, but also we were transitioning industries. And so I actually met my new accountant at, at Ventrex. He became a member and we connected and had good rapport and all that. And so when I got the new account, this was the first time anybody had looked at like my, my financial statements, my P&L, my balance sheet and, and critiqued not just like the numbers, like, you know, I, my whole focus was the numbers. What is, you know, just, am I making money? Am I losing money? What, are, what am I, what do they say? But, but he was looking at it, how they were arranged and, and how the numbers we had were displayed on those sheets. And he seemed to, he, he was of the opinion, is of the opinion that it matters, like how our financial statements are set up. For instance, he was like, you know, your, as a co-working space, your cost of goods sold and your, or your payroll and your rent should be under cost of goods sold not under expenses. And, and this line item might actually be down here and you want to condense these things. And so he was very focused on how we arrange things. And his logic was that banks care about how they are seeing the information, the numbers you're giving, how, what, how are those numbers displayed? And he said, you want a bank to ask as few questions as possible when they are re reviewing your financial statements. And if something is off, if it's not where they expect it to be, Again, in my mind, something off is, oh, there's a number off. And he's like, forget about the right side of the sheet, the numbers. On the left side, if something's out of place or, or not represented in, an, in the order that, that they're used to seeing it, it's going to cause them to dig in deeper. And they're going to, they're going to one, maybe question your experience. They're going to give credibility to you if it's the right way. But if it's the wrong way, they're going to start to kind of focus in a little more. And, and the more a bank focuses in, the more they're able to critique and, and find issues. Is it, do you think that's true? I mean, do you guys, does it matter? Like, should somebody invest the time and potentially the money in before they even approach the bank? Again, most business owners are thinking of numbers, but thinking about how they're showing you guys their numbers, does that matter to you guys? Yes and no. So an analyst is going to go through all of your historical numbers, you know, for the past three years, and they're going to make comparisons year over year. So if you've done things like change accountants and things are reported differently, they're going to ask questions along the lines of, you had this expense, it was $20,000 in this year, but I don't see it historically. Is this new? Does it fall into a different category? And you'll get a lot of questions around that just because they want to make their comparisons, you know, as, as easy as possible. They have to explain all that. They have to explain what's going on. And it calls, when you can speak to those numbers, you know, if you change accountants, like it's totally fine. But if you have a good understanding of your numbers and where everything is reported, that goes a long way, you know, because the credit analyst can jump in a loan committee and say, this person knows their numbers. We asked X, Y, Z questions. They knew exactly where it was, you know, in their P&L and their tax return, whatever it might be. A lot of times you get people who don't know their numbers and 
depending on the size of the deal and the and the credit committee size, you know, that we're going to for approval, it could call into question, you know, are these believable? They're so all over the place. Is this legitimate? You know, are are they trying to hide something? You know, things like that. So yeah, we do we do pay attention to things like that. All right. So ready for the next hot seat question? If you yeah. could be an animal, what would you be and why? Ooh, that's a good one. Richie, that's while she one. thinks, what would you be, Richie? <laughs> Flamingo? I, I, I'd be a rhinoceros. I like that. Nobody messes with a rhinoceros. That is a good one. I think maybe an elephant. Elephants are wise, right? They know they know a lot. They've got good memories. I like to see that kind of fits. Kind of fits me a little bit. <laughs> yeah, and elephants are, are super <laughs> nurturing and motherly, right? So talk to us about your your two kiddos. How old? Names? What do they love? Yeah. So Molly is my five year old, and Kelly is my two year old. They love each other for as much as they fight with each other. They do love each other just as much. But they're great. They're they're super into trolls right now. The trolls movies, <laughs> cartoons, and Molly being five, she's you know starting to get into figuring out what kind of activities she's interested in. So you know both kids are in swimming, and Molly's really enjoying gymnastics at the moment. She's getting a lot better at that. So we're really proud watching her progress. What's your favorite? I mean, within gymnastics, I mean, what is what does she love doing? The tumbling, or what is? Yeah, I think the tumbling. She's a little nervous around flipping around on bars and things like that, but she really likes the tumbling. I think she wants to do a handstand really bad, so she's been working hard at those, and I see her practicing her splits here and there. <laughs> so that's, I think I think the tumbling is her favorite, and the balance beam. She does like balance beam. That's awesome. So yeah. talk to us about your team. What does your team look like at Byline? Is, I mean, is it a large team? Is it a small team? Is it throughout the country? I mean, what what's that look like? Yeah, so we've got lenders nationwide. We all lend nationwide. I go everywhere. My specific team within the bank is me, my supervisor, and we have one other girl that helps us out as well. Our underwriting is all in-house. Our closing is all in-house, you know, which I, which I think is a big benefit, you know, to have that availability. But after COVID, all of our employees are pretty much nationwide at this point. A lot of people have moved away from, you know, Chicago and Wisconsin, which is where we're based. And, you know, we've hired a lot of people outside of our specific area as well. So we are nationwide. And how long have you, did you say you've been with Byline now? I Yeah, I've been there 10 years. years. That's all. Awesome. You know, yeah. it's. It's so I love that you've worked your way through the credit department and up through into the role you're in now. It certainly helps you understand the entire process from different standpoints. So, so Definitely. that's great. Richie, you got anything? I mean, I was curious if you could very discreetly describe maybe maybe a co-working deal that you guys decided against and and, and give us maybe some reasons why you you passed on that deal without obviously disclosing any specifics. I just should be curious to know I'm one and one with you guys. So I feel pretty good. But yeah. Like, yeah. What, what about somebody who maybe didn't get the financing? What were some of the URL's thoughts behind that? Honestly, I haven't had one yet. So the majority of the work that I've done in the space is through VentureX Office Evolution, you know, the vast group. So when they are, you know, reaching out about prospects, as a, as a franchisor, you're looking for specific points in a franchisee, right? So they're looking for a lot of the same things we are. So when those people come through, you know, I look at them I'm like, well, you know, maybe this one's a little weaker on their PFS. Maybe this one's a little weak in their management experience, you know, but we can find ways to mitigate that and it works. When I've lost out on deals, it's because people don't want to do the SBA loan. They can either finance the project on their own and they're saying, well, why do I need the SBA? I can do this on my own. You know, or they just decide against getting into the industry altogether. But I haven't, I haven't lost one in the approval process yet. Is there, it seems like, and, and this just could be because I was unaware of it before, mm -hmm. it seems like the majority of banks are really leaning in on SBA loans now in a way that I would say even five years ago, I didn't notice if it was happening. Is is that because the guarantee is so much higher from the government because of COVID, or is that because the banking industry, you know, there, there's some there's some instability there in some places? Like, what are are banks really 
like if 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 somebody wanted a loan to you guys, but they didn't want an SBA loan, what's the likelihood that you would be like, all right, we'll we'll try a conventional loan? Like it seems like some banks only want to do SBA loans, and if if you're yeah. not doing an SBA loan, then you talk to somebody else. So I work within Byline's SBA arm. That's all we do. So I'm not going to do a conventional loan, you know, in this space. Byline does have a conventional team, but their market is strictly the Chicago, Wisconsin, Indiana area. So they're not doing conventional loans outside of that. The SBA has kind of popped up post COVID, you know, more and more other banks are looking into getting into it. I think the whole PPP program kind of gave them an insight into what the SBA is about, you know, but there are a lot of rules that you have to follow. And you know, banks just getting into it, they might not know all those nuances yet. Even after the fact, even after a loan is closed, there's still things that are going on, you know, behind the scenes as far as compliance, reporting, auditing, you know, by the SBA and things like that. So the other thing that you have to make sure of too is that, you know, you're protecting the guarantee because if something does go wrong, you know, and you submit to the SBA to say, hey, you know, this deal defaulted, we'd like to collect on that guarantee, they're they're going through that. They're making sure that your documentation is to the T. And, you know, these newer players that are getting in, you know, they're not at that point yet. They don't know, you know, what's going to happen when things get to that point. So right now there's a boom. But, you know, as things progress, you might see people pulling back from that or they're learning from their mistakes and they're continuing to grow and, you know, strengthen their SBA programs. It just it kind of depends. But it's a it's a tedious process. Yes, on all in. On all, yeah. Back to your point. I mean, it's a it's a lot of money. These are not small deals, right? This is in a yeah. twelve hundred square foot donut shop. I mean, these are ten to thirty thousand square foot spaces that that take significant about amount of build out and operating and everything else. So certainly, what I love about what we get to do, or at least me specifically, is help people make the decisions they need to be making, right? And I get to make a difference in people's lives, right? Because most people are investing a big chunk of their retirement, right? Or in some cases, a big ch chunk of their net worth, or they're bringing in other people's money, fam friends and family specifically a lot of times. And so I think that's what I love about it is, is helping people make the right decisions that are going to affect their lives and their families' lives. It's a big part that I love. Yeah, definitely. So what are you most excited about GWA? And um, Phoenix? Um, I'm, I'm really just excited to see who's there. Oh. I would love to meet more people in the independent space because that's, you know, kind of newer. Like I said, most of the stuff that I've done has been with VentureX and Office Evolution. So I'd really love to get, you know, some feedback from people in the independent space. I would love to run into people that I've worked with before. It's been a while since I've seen some of them. So I'm hoping to see, you know, those people there. Richie, I'm excited to see you. <laughs> it's sure. probably been, what, about a year, I think, since I last visited you. So, yeah, I'm just mostly excited to meet people. Actually, is she financing Nashville? Uh I have read, I, we have exchanged emails. I'm trying to figure out what I even need because that deal is so interesting. We yep. don't need much. And so it's kind of like, thankfully, you know, the space is coming mostly furnished. Like our expenses, our out-of-pocket expenses are going to be relatively low. I'm, I'm mostly just looking for, I need some soft seating and I need some operating capital, but we also just completed our second capital raise. So I, I have some cash to like, I'm trying to decide if the amount of money I need for this specific project is worth the process of going through, you know, going through the SBA's process. So we haven't solidified anything yet. We are close to two other deals. Geo, as you know, we, we walked some buildings last week for the second time. And so I will definitely be reaching out on those two, even if, even if the Nashville one is able to, you know, kind of be handled in house, so to speak. Yeah. Back to the first example, like I'm working with a startup that came through Jamie in Boise, right? And she's got enough. She's super, she's done all her homework. She understands it really well, but her cash is tight. And so for, for the first time I toured with her, I was like, have you considered an SBA? And she's like, well, no, I don't think I need it. And the further we've gotten into it, the ability to have um, some cash flow for the operating side, for the ramp up time, for all those things makes a big difference. And the space we're getting is already built out, but she's got to get furniture and some other things. And so 
it even gives landlords a comfort level to be like, hey, I've got, you know, I've got a contingency plan, right? I've got yes. the support from Byline and SBA and all these things. And the beauty of it is you don't use it. You don't have to, you don't have to utilize it, right? You can, you can right. uh, find other ways to do it. And so I think sometimes people aren't aware of the resources they have, which is what I'm most excited about getting you and some of your industry colleagues on a stage to kind of talk about, you know, the options, but also getting, you know, people that have used your services or SBA in general to kind of talk about why and how and all those fun things to just to, to give people a better understanding of, of what, uh, what's out there, right? The resourcing is, is incredible. Why not use it? Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So last question for Richie, what is it? For Caitlin, I have no idea. I'm not going to give you a question. What question are you going to give Caitlin? A good one. Oh, me a question for Caitlin? Oh man, where 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 is the favorite place you've gone to finance a co-working space? Like what 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 city, town, region, oh. or your office? Can't say fair. I, I love it. Well, assume Fairfax is number one, and just it, less yeah. on. Look, you can start with number two, and we'll call it number one. To be honest with you, I did I did enjoy the Fairfax visit, mostly because you got, you know, a unique place, right? You're right by the government. So your area is a little bit different and you kind of had to set up your space a little bit differently, you know, than some of the usuals. So that I thought was really cool. In general, I really enjoy Florida. So <laughs> I've been to a couple locations in Florida so far and Coming out of Chicago in the wintertime, you step off that plane and I'm just like, ha, oh, it's warm. I, I miss this. So I did enjoy those those visits. But they're also cool areas, too. I mean, I've I've been places in Florida now that I haven't been before. So, so yeah. final question. If your spouse was to say the three things they love about you most, what would those three things be? <laughs> good cook goofy and can go along you know with with just being silly and and carefree and very motivated very motivated awesome well caitlin we are so excited that uh, we're going to get to see you on a stage soon thank you so much for taking time to do this look forward to to just seeing more and more of you in the industry and, and byline and more involvement thank you for uh, being willing to to take a deep dive into the industry and 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 help better um, people's opportunities to to kind of grow and 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 find success. Um, and we'll we'll definitely put in your contact information uh, when whenever we post this. Uh, my goal is to get it up before uh, GWA so people can get a little teaser before. But we'll let you know when it comes up. Thank you so much, Richie. Thanks for jumping in and and sitting in the hot seat for a little bit too. Yeah. Thank you, Caitlin. Appreciate it. Thank you, boss. This was fun. <laughs>